Hi, I'm Dave again from Saturday Morning Astrophysics at Purdue. Let's start with a question. When you look out across the cosmos and the night sky, what comes to mind? What do you think of? Where could your imagination take you? You see stars, you might see constellations. You might think of cultures long lost from the past. Maybe you think of the future. But what about planets? We have four visible planets, common in the night sky, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. But what about planets outside our solar system? Our Milky Way galaxy alone has a hundred million million stars. Do those stars have planets? And beyond our own galaxy, what about the other galaxies in the universe? Do the stars in those galaxies have planets? Could they? Well, in the mid-1990s, scientists found evidence of the first star-based exoplanet planet in a st surrounding a star, orbiting a star, other than our own sun. And since that time, with the aid of the Kepler mission, we have discovered almost 4,000 planets orbiting stars other than our own exoplanets. So exoplanets exist. And we're going to talk about how we find them and what the implications of finding them might have. So how do scientists know that exoplanets exist? What evidence do they look for? Let's start with a model. Let's take an average star and a planet. And the planet is in orbit around the star. And what do you think you might observe every time the planet passed in front of the star in its orbit? Well, the star has certain brightness. It has a luminosity. And if we, if we look at that from a distance, let's just call that brightness. And if an object comes in front of the star, what do you think you might observe? Now, you can't see it because it's too far away. However, we can measure the change in brightness as small as it might be. And that would tell us that something is happening to the star to decrease its brightness. And if we see that in a periodic fashion, then we might know that something is happening on a regular basis. And that could be something passing in front of the star. And that could be an exoplanet. So in 2012, when the planet Venus crossed in front of the sun, we could see the planet image silhouetted by the sun through a telescope, but we couldn't see the change in brightness of the sunlight coming to Earth. The sun is so much larger than the planet, the planet didn't cast a shadow. And so the only way we could determine that was with measurement. Now, let's take that to the extreme. Observing the transit of a planet between the Earth and the sun is easy. We've got a close-up view, relatively speaking. But trying to find transits of planets around other stars, the closest of which is over four light years away, wouldn't you agree is a pretty daunting task? So as you might guess, the job of finding exoplanets might be pretty difficult. However, with some simple data collection and analysis, we can learn a lot. Let me show you. So let's consider a model of a planet in orbit around a star. So what kind of data might we collect from a planet transiting across a star during its orbit? Well, let's graph the data and see what it looks like. The brightness, so we're going to graph brightness versus time. The brightness will remain constant until what? Until when? Until the planet passes in front of the star. And during the path in front of the star, what do you think we will observe? The brightness will decrease. And once the planet passes by the star, it continues on its orbit, then the, loop, the brightness will remain the same. And then the planet comes around again, the brightness drops, it passes in front of the star, it transits the star, passes by, 
and continues on its way. And so we end up with a graph with regular systematic intervals, which is an indication of how often the planet orbits the star, its orbital period. So one of the more interesting things that we can discover from data of exoplanets orbiting their stars is we can estimate the mean temperature of the planet. And what implications might that have? Well, consider water. Water is essential for life. And if a planet had a mean temperature that fell within the range of the freezing point and the boiling point of water, and water was in the liquid state, what might that mean? So with that, let's turn you over to the searching for exoplanet simulation. All right, let's take a quick look at the simulation that you will be running. And when you open the window, you see you have an option here to enter a number from one to five. We have five different simulations. Let's just enter a number four. And when we do that, we see a window with uh, first of all, let me point out the stellar radius is given. That's also provided in the information table, so you don't need to copy it down from here. You see a planet, and you see a star, and you see, uh, first of all, a note. These are not to scale, necessarily, but uh, we have a, a pause and a run button. Now, you can also use your space bar to do that. And below the planet and star window, we have the luminosity logger, which is a graph of brightness versus time. Now, if you like, let's go over to the menu here and make this full screen. And I can almost see them both in the same window. Now with the luminosity logger, I can locate the points that I want to use to measure. So for example, the change in brightness from one down to 0.989, that would give me my change in brightness. And also, the time from in Earth days between peaks, that would be the orbital period. And so, you know, about 91 days and uh, 451 or 454 days would be, I can subtract and get the orbital period. I also have the option, if I like, to zoom in and out, if that helps you. Uh, you, If you zoom too far, let's run that. If you zoom too far, you're going to find yourself between the planet and the star, so it would appear. Now, at this point, I can see the planet go across the face of the star. If I zoom in too far, for all intents and purposes, I'm in front of the planet, I'm between the planet and the star, and I won't see a cross, uh, I won't see a transit across the star. So it's possible to get in a little too far. Anyway, um, to run the next scenario, you can come up to the run uh, option and it'll say view the, view the result, but if you click that, you'll then have the option again to put in another number, which I can do and rerun the simulation. Okay, so before we leave the simulation, let me just point out, if you feel like an adventure, you can actually edit the code. We've put that in here for you. And you can scroll through the, through the code, change parameters for your star, for your exoplanet, and create your own little worlds. So if you feel like doing that, uh, it might be a little tricky, but I'm sure you can have some fun. With that, I will let you go and we'll see you at the live Zoom for SMAP.